Give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money. Hey everyone, it's been a long time since we've had a Q&A style video and the old one is pretty outdated, so I figured it was time to do another to factor in all the things that have changed since then, like my critical style, my pet peeves with you fuckers, and my, you know, gender. Anyway, let's get going and get the really generic questions out of the way first. My favorite movie? Tangled. My favorite TV show? Family Guy. My favorite video game? Kingdom Hearts. My favorite food? Tacos. My favorite song? Monster. My favorite Kingdom Hearts character? Sora. My favorite Warcraft character? Sylvanas Windrunner. My favorite Pokemon? Gardevoir. Least favorite of all those things? The Matrix, The Walking Dead, Dark Souls, Seafood, literally anything by Nicki Minaj, Roxas, Varrock, Sourfang, and Gallade. What's going on with your voice? Why does it sound so different in live streams than in your videos? I'm a trans woman and I've been doing vocal training for about a year now. The reasons you hear my voice sounding so loud and deep in my scripted videos like now is because I'm deliberately putting on a more authoritative affectation in order to retain the attention of the viewer. There's a deliberateness to my tone that I prefer to have and that my audience appreciates that I just can't achieve with my regular speaking voice. One of the most frequently praised aspects of my work is the fact that I speak with a great deal of finality and confidence and that I eschew the usual mealy mouth doublespeak that a lot of YouTubers do. This often gets me tone police by performative allies because nothing makes them angrier than a marginalized woman who's loud, but it's a major selling point of my work to people who aren't sensitive little brats. My regular speaking voice is a lot softer and less clear and final sounding. It makes me sound more like MLP analysis channels with their meek and submissive tone they use to suck up to the viewer, and that's an attitude I really hate and don't want put into my work. Maybe when my vocal training is coming along better and I get better control of my feminine voice I might switch them, but for now I'll stick with the dissonance. I want to start doing cartoon reviews on YouTube but I don't want to step on anybody else's toes. Do you have any advice for this? That's not how this works. YouTube works like this, survival of the fittest. The way you get noticed is you make a better video than the other guy. Individual YouTube communities will try to operate on some imaginary code of honor where they try to carve out their own territories, but if you really want to get noticed, you have to disregard those imaginary rules. I got into doing MLP analysis videos because I hated every single analysis video I'd ever seen. I distinctly recall the first real script that became Glass of Water was provoked because Dr. Wolf made a video about why do we care about MLP and went on this really big, waffly, self-important screen about the closeness of the community and how it's a big family, and I thought that was such complete and total bullshit, so I made a video about the real merits of the show and that it was just a funny show. This is why I tend to laugh when people like Wolf and Silverquill whine about how I've become so toxic over the years, because some of the first videos I ever made were about how other people in the community fucking suck, and here's why. So if you want to get noticed and grow and stand out, you have to make a better video than the other guy, and if the other guy sulks in the process, then that just means you're doing it right. Why do you have ratings disabled and comments filtered on all of your videos? The rating system is obsolete as both likes and dislikes have the same effect of bolstering your search rankings, and for community feedback it's always been completely useless. A thumbs up or thumbs down doesn't tell me anything about what people liked or had problems with, it's just a contextless yay or nay in a video that had a lot of different things in it. And when compared with the audience retention metric, it's often easy to see how little a dislike spree actually matters. If you're the kind of person who was celebrating the fact that 2018's YouTube Rewind was aggressively disliked, you're an idiot because all you've done is make it trend harder. As for the comment section, I like to engage with the viewers. It's something that gives me a great deal of enjoyment, even though a lot of you are extremely thick and ask the same questions over and over again. But that can't happen without comment moderation. Leaving the comment section unmoderated will mean that shit gets buried under every single dumb shit brain fart someone had in the comment section, especially when a video first goes up. So I enforce a certain degree of intellectual bare minimum on people to encourage that kind of discussion over just fishing for likes by offering the best sound bite. The comment section should be a place to get clarification and follow-ups on a given video, and that can't happen if both you and I have to sit through so much garbage garbage to find it. I'd rather it be useful than just leave a completely unfiltered out of a misguided idea that not having standards is somehow better. How do you feel about your collaboration on Over a Barrel with Josh now that the two of you hate each other? In addition, how do you feel about your friendship deteriorating in the first place? I wasn't happy when it first came out, and I'm even less happy with it now. I didn't have as much of a say in the writing of that video as I would have liked, otherwise I wouldn't have been playing devil's advocate for it as much, or saying half the shit I said in that video. Josh even flat out admitted years later that I was only invited to be a Native American yes girl to deflect any accusations of racism, which is ironic because doing that is extremely racist. And so I ended up making most of Josh's worst jokes for him. I wouldn't have agreed to any of this if I hadn't been hoping to make a torrent of death threats from Josh's alt-right cult actually stop, and so I was in a position where Josh was able to twist my 
arm more than he would have been able to otherwise, a mistake I spent the next three years not allowing him to repeat, much to his chagrin. I'd rather the video be deleted entirely, as I don't think very highly of it, and I'd rather not be associated with the alt-right man-child who wrote me into it. As for our friendship deteriorating, it ultimately turned out to be a good thing. Josh required way too much coddling to keep him happy, and he was so emotionally stunted, delicate, and selfish that half the time he was just making me miserable. Josh's complete lack of empathy for other human beings is not something anybody should force themselves to tolerate, and Josh only hung around with me because I was his token liberal minority and LGBT friend. He only wanted me around for the sake of his ego and didn't like it when I didn't quietly accept all of his horrible opinions and actually thought politics was important. He's a toxic and vile person to anybody who doesn't toe his line. Are there any Yautabas that influence your work? And on the flip side, are there any Yautabas you just like watching in general? My biggest influences are Movie Bob and Jim Sterling when it comes to how I like to frame my content, but in general, I also like to watch Primitive Technology, The Killian Experience, Joseph Anderson, Innuendo Studios, and Picaspri. I used to watch all of H Bomber Guy and Lindsay Ellis' work multiple times, but both of them been rather dormant on actual content in the last year, and what they have been putting out has just been rather drab and uninteresting, and honestly, it's just not worth sitting through the aggressive sponsorships these days. Like, I get it, Skillshare, you really want my money, will you go away now? Also, Lindsay Ellis insists on using the Q slur, which is a deal breaker, especially when the rest of your content just isn't that interesting. Breach Gaming was also someone I watched a lot of, but as time went on, he stopped doing things like class guides, legacy videos, and other videos I was turning out for in favor of the daily preach and drama time over and over and over again, which is... it's just boring. What would you say has been the biggest change in how you critique shows and movies? I tend to skip right to the meat of a review and laser focus on the story, characters, and themes. This is what separates my content from a lot of similar channels, in that I care about what a story is saying, and not how much lore is dumped into the wiki. Over the years, I've double, triple, and quadrupled down on this idea. More than half of the Steven Universe video is taken up by the terrible themes, the terrible characterization, and the myopia of its creator, and very little on the lore or animation, and I only included those things because I like the big videos to be complete. I know too much about the animation industry to really care about the animation itself. People often fight for 2D animation animation, but they keep forgetting that 2D animation died due to the terrible writing it was subjected to for over a decade. The Disney Renaissance was rather short-lived, and Disney's output quickly nosedived in the quality of writing. Think about it, the Disney Renaissance had The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King as massive mega-hits. Almost immediately afterward, there were Pocahontas, Hunchback, and Hercules. They were okay movies, except Pocahontas, but they weren't as memorable as the big four, and whenever people try to bring back 2D animation, they always try to bring it back by making another treasure planet instead of another Lion King. And while Treasure Planet looked nice, it was the writing that made people not want to watch movies like that anymore. I always remember that when I'm criticizing animation, as it's the writing that will always make or break the success of a work, and oftentimes the quality. A lot of animation snobs stubbornly reject this idea with piffy remarks like, The animation isn't important in an animated show? Yeah, that is the case. Think about it, when was the last time a live-action TV show or movie had its cinematography talked about over the writing, story, themes, or even performances of the actors? It's a simple basic principle, guys, just pull your head out of your ass. Is there any reason that your videos aren't as elaborately edited as other people in the analysis community like Silver Quill or Firebrand? I always ask myself, is this making the video better? A big problem that Silver Quill had with his videos for a long time, and what made them take so long to come out, was that they were overly edited with a lot of skits, many of which were neither funny or connected to what he was reviewing. Taking too seriously went the same way in an attempt to follow the leader. When I was editing for them, a lot of the skits and gags really added nothing to the review and just made the editing take longer. I actually found out why both of them were doing this. Doug Walker tripled down on sketches and the two of them were just copying whatever he does. Walker does it because he sincerely thinks it's funny to clog up a video with skits and both Silverquill and Josh are hacks cloning their favorite YouTuber. It's something I don't like and I'd rather critics just get to the damn point, so I set a rule for myself that unless something is absolutely necessary to the video, it's not going in. Avoiding bloat and avoiding clogging up videos videos with self-indulgent fluff is a high priority for me. Never be too proud to cut something if it's not crucial to the video, and setting myself deadlines is one of the ways I ensure that my videos are content-rich and not padded with nonsense. Except Sylvana screaming for the horde. For the horde! That was the best thing ever and I'll fucking fight you. This is actually why I've aped the framework of the Jimquisition with a puppet intro, the meat of the video, and then the outro as it serves an ideal framework if I want to include a little bit of self-indulgent tomfoolery, so it stays at the start and end of the video and the actual content remains uninterrupted. What do you think about the discussions going on about clickbait and its overuse? Complaining about clickbait is a futile effort if you're still clicking on clickbait. I remember that Cracked once explained why all their articles are numbered lists, and the explanation was pretty direct and simple. Cracked, why are you complaining about clickbait when all your articles or lists about mind-blowing whatever. Well, 
I'll tell you why we're on the right list, because you don't f***ing click on anything else. A large portion of the reader base is easily distracted and attracted to sensationalism. It's what they want out of their media, hence why there's so much clickbait. The only way to really stop clickbait is to become better consumers and stop clicking on it. Drawing attention to clickbait and treating it like something that outlets have to stop on their own despite its overwhelming success is quite frankly ridiculous. A similar thing happens when a teenager does something impressive and the title says something like 16 year old does something really cool. There's no shortage of charity cases whining that they erase the kid's name. What's hilarious is that the kid's name is in the article and when confronted with this, the people complaining will repeat the sentiment of marketing executives and say, well, most people only read the title, so the information should be there. No, you need to learn to read. If you don't already know that the information you want is in the article, that's a failing on yourself and you need to correct it. Not expect other people to compensate for it just because you're too proud and stubborn to admit you're wrong. Be a better consumer and clickbait will go away. Is there a trope that you would get rid of if you could? And is it snapshot redemptions? Snapshot redemptions aren't a trope, they're just a bad redemption arc. A snapshot redemption happens when someone wants to have a redemption arc because they read a Tumblr post about how great Zuko was and they want to do one of those, but they don't understand what makes a redemption arc work and so they just hastily rush to the end. If I could get rid of a trope, it would be the romantic relationship that starts when the story ends. If we stopped doing that and started having romantic relationships start in the first act, most of the things you guys hate from romantic subplots would go away. You wouldn't need to worry about which characters have chemistry, you wouldn't be teased for an entire season with a ship, you wouldn't have any of that crap. If I was running Star vs. the Forces of Evil, I would have paired Star and Marco halfway through Season 1 and had them stay together for the rest of the series. I know some people start sulking when I suggest that because they're tired of the typical cliché of two main characters getting together, but that hasn't actually been an omnipresent cliché for 12 years, so I think you'll fucking live. What is your favorite genre? My favorite genre is romance. I love a good story about a cute relationship, which is the reason I tend to get irritated by stories that end with a couple getting together. It's like a video game ending after the tutorial is over, but I promised myself I wouldn't complain about Pokemon Sun and Moon today. If you could pinpoint the moment that friendship is magic turned into hot garbage. What would it be? I would say it would be the point where Hasbro copied the Starlight story onto four other characters. That was the point where it became clear that the writers have become too proud to admit that a bad idea isn't working. They have stubbornly resisted all criticism of Starlight, either painting her critics as reactionary or infantile, and they continue pushing such a garbage character into the face of the viewers. Hasbro has been doubling down on this, where an idea that doesn't work, like the map or the school of friendship, is pushed really hard and the writers try so hard to justify it, not only to the viewer but to themselves, because they're too proud to admit when they fucked up. What would you say is the most annoying thing? thing about interacting with your community. I know you complain about mundane questions a lot. But is that the extent of it? If I had to pick one, it would have to be just how terminally clueless a lot of my viewers are. I get no shortage of people in the comments of every video asking what's going on with the difference between the voice, puppet, and name, and a lot of them will include a question asking if I'm transgender. Despite being able to pick out transgender as their first guest, they still ask the question anyway, although I do get a chuckle when someone adds in, I'm so confused. Like, bitch, who do you think you're fooling? You'd think the name would eventually clue people in, but apparently not. Some people seem to really need their hands held through everything. The amount of times I'll get a question or asked to clarify something that I've already clarified is astounding, and it only comes from the fact that a lot of viewers don't pay attention to half of what they consume, and they're too lazy to find the answers themselves. It's easier for them to constantly nag me than it is to just go watch some videos you were probably going to watch anyway and actually pay attention to them this time. It bothers me because I make so many videos teaching people to discern information on their own, and yet the inability, or rather unwillingness, of a lot of my viewers to actually do that doesn't gel with that theme. Do you accept fanat? And if so, what kinds? So I accept all kinds of fan arts with relatively few restrictions. The submission email in the description is the only reliable way to be sure that I see whatever you're sending me. My only real request is that if you're going to draw fan art, please restrict yourself to only the most current iteration of the puppet. I actually started doing a fan art reel in Glass of Water, and only fan art sent to the email address will be allowed in. Lewd fan art will be black barred or omitted entirely if the content is particularly extreme. And please be sure to include an artist handle in case your email gives me your real name, or just tell me you don't want to be included. What are the rules regarding the submission? email. There are none. I filter the email at my own discretion, and as a result, you can pretty much send me anything and you likely won't hear a word of complaint from me. And yes, people have tested this resolve before. I get no shortage of people asking me for personal feedback on their writing or personal advice in their life, despite the fact that it's not my job to do either of those things. Generally, I don't respond to emails sent to me as it's effectively a P.O. box, so if you send me something I find objectionable, I either delete it or have similar content already filtered. This is different from the comment section or other forms of interacting with me because I've explicitly put myself in this position and I accepted going in that if I tell people there are no restrictions, they're going to act like there are no restrictions. I've already set the email up so that I don't get surprised by anything because everything is filtered into individual folders based on keywords in the subject line. Are you straight, bi, or a lesbian? I'm a lesbian. I'm also a trans woman. 
And how long can I expect to be on HRT before there are any effects? That depends on your dosage and your own hormone levels. I've been on HRT for less of a year, but already it's had some pretty significant effects on me. But it's also important to realize that you probably won't notice them without a side-by-side -side comparison because the changes are slow enough to slip by you unnoticed. This is why you see some trans people do that thing where they take a picture of themselves every day for a year in order to document the changes themselves in a time lapse. But more than just HRT is how much work you actually put into your transition while you're on it. I've seen significant changes, but only part of that is because of HRT. I've also been styling and treating my hair and learning to do my makeup, which all had a cumulative effect on my ability to pass. Also, the effects of HRT can wildly differ based on your own health. Fat redistribution is a big one. Having more estrogen in your system will change how your body stores fat, but it won't move the fat that's already there. So if you have high estrogen from HRT, your body will store excess fat on your thighs, hips, and breasts rather than your stomach, but it won't move the fat that's already on your stomach. You'd have to burn that off yourself. And if you really want to develop those parts of your body, you have to do new kinds of exercises and changes to your diet to emphasize that. Ultimately, you get out of HRT what you put into it. HRT makes it easier to develop a more feminine or masculine body type depending on which way you're going, but you have to do the things that develop that body anyway. You're not going to get a curvy frame just from taking some estrogen pills. Just like cis women, your figure will vary depending on your metabolism and lifestyle. How difficult is it to pass as your preferred gender? Funnily enough, it depends on the weather. It's easier for me to pass in the winter than it is in the summer because a long winter coat is good at cloaking the oddities in my body. So most people will recognize my gender based on my face and hair, which is why doing my makeup and styling my hair is so important. But in the summer, I can't do that without getting heat stroke, so I often wear shapewear under my clothes in order to compensate. One thing that really helps, regardless of the season, is wearing heeled boots because they alter the way you balance yourself and you end up with a much more feminine stride and you have to stand up straight to keep balance. Also, the clacking associated with heels is itself associated with women, so it's a lot easier to guide people toward viewing you as a woman. Most people won't pay you any mind, and if they do, it'll be a passing glance. Get it? Passing? So while imperfections might stand out to you in the bathroom mirror, because that's how dysphoria works, it doesn't stand out to most other people. This is why, despite almost every makeup tutorial jumping right to it, you don't really need to worry about contouring unless you intend for people to be looking closely at your face, which is weird since so many trans makeup guides focus on it above all else. Ultimately, the most important things are going to be your silhouette and how you carry yourself, because that's what most people are going to notice first, and likely all they're going to notice. The bone structure of your face? probably won't even be given a passing glance. Are you single or in a relationship? I am now. When I started writing this Q&A, I was actually engaged to a woman I'd been with for three years, but since then the relationship fell completely apart, so now I'm single again. What happened to you in 2018? 2018 saw my previously diligent schedule fall apart as the year continued to beat me into the ground. A lot of really horrible things happened to me which I detailed in Not Good Enough and which I'd rather not get into here, but suffice to say that I've been doing much better and I've been getting back on track, and right now I'm the happiest I've been in the last three years. Anyway, thank Thanks for joining me today, everyone. I hope this was an enlightening experience for you all, and I hope you have a fantastic day. <laughs>